We are so glad you're here. My name is Devin Kleffer. I'll be your host tonight. I'm also a faculty member here at MVC. Tonight, we're talking about how learners can thrive at MVC. And once again, thanks for joining us. We know that you've got a busy schedule and we are so glad you took some time out of it to hang out with us tonight. Just a little bit of preview for what to expect tonight. We've got a panel in store for you. I'll be leading the panel through some questions that regard some of the academics and some of the uh, other associated things with MVC. We've got part of our administrators here. We've got some of our faculty here. And we're also going to give you a chance, dear audience member, to ask questions as well. You can just type questions into the chat there and our fabulous chat bots will grab that and they'll put it on uh, my document here that's before me. So please don't hesitate at any point to type your questions into the chat category. I also want to say, in addition to our goal as far as tonight, to be able to paint an accurate picture for you for what it means to be a learner and a family member that's part of the NBC learning community, I also want to remind you that for each live session of these NBC live events, for each live session that you attend, you're going to automatically be entered into a drawing for a chance to win a $500 tuition credit. Um, now, our lawyers are asking me that I read this to you, so bear with me here. One entry per household, okay? You don't need to get grandma and all your kids and your pets on all at once. One entry per household per live stream event. I believe we've got six or seven events lined up for you, so you can get up to seven entries, seven entries for that $500 tuition credit. With that, let's go ahead and welcome our panel tonight. Joining us, we have from our administrative staff, high school principal and middle school principal. And ladies, welcome to tonight's NBC Live event. Thank you, Devin. Middle school principal Carissa Medina here, joining high school principal Susie Swing. Listen, um, Susie, I'm going to bring you in since you are the high school principal. Let me bring you into the conversation from the get-go tonight. Listen, when we talk about being a learner at MVC, give us a little snapshot, a little overview of what it means and how we approach learning itself at MVC. Okay, I love talking about this. Um, I know if we have any parents that are joining us that have been to Experience MVC, this might sound a little bit like something you've heard me say before, um, but I want first just for families to always know um, our hearts, and this is mine and Carissa's and our faculty, and that is that our kids, we believe your kids, our students are intentionally and uniquely designed and created by a loving God. So we want you to know that that's what we believe and that's how we approach um, our students in the classroom. And because of that, we believe that there's an opportunity for them to really develop those unique gifts and talents. We also believe that with that ability to really craft something beautiful, it also comes into play in this really messy brokenness in this world that we live in. And we know this if we just look around us, right, in the health crisis that um, we're addressing and the conflict and the politics and all of the stuff that surrounds what's happening right now in our communities, in our families, um, and for our students. We want them to know that this messiness and this brokenness is okay, that there is hope, that there is a redeemer, and that there is something um, that allows us a way out of that brokenness and that messiness. And we think that learning at Monta Vista is also a beautiful picture of that. We want our kids in the classroom to feel safe and to know that they can learn in an environment where it is okay to, to take risks and to fail at something and to make mistakes, that we are imperfect people and we bring that into the learning and that that's part of the beauty of learning. And even in the classroom, we get to see those things, those, that beauty that's crafted out of that messiness. So I, for me, that's the very basis of it. That's the heart of who we are and what we do and anything else we talk about. Um, I would want families to, to know first and foremost that that's what we believe about, about their kids and what learning is. A picture of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And just as a living example, I'm hosting a webcast that I blew my boss's name on. So um, we believe that we can recover and grow through iteration here at NBC. Um, Susie, throughout tonight, we're going to toss out this phrase, international baccalaureate. Sometimes we'll refer to it as IB. Give us a little bit of overview of, of what that is. What does it mean to be an international baccalaureate or an IB school? 
Yeah, it, it's great. It's something really exciting for us. So we were just authorized um, a year ago for our uh, diploma program. We're in the process of an additional authorization um, for our middle years, which is our grade six or 10. You're going to hear a lot about that from the different panel members. So I'm not going to go in depth, but IB is an organization in which schools or international baccalaureate uh, schools become members of this organization and it provides a, an approach to learning. So it provides a framework for us. And it aligns really well with what we believe about kids. It's very student-centered. It um, really focuses on that conceptual understanding and also focuses on the way in which our um, students are developing as learners. So it's not just about um, that knowledge acquisition. It's also how are they developing as independent learners. So you're going to hear a lot more about that, but it's an exciting thing for us as we're entering into this um, journey with IB and this approach to learning. Yes. Yeah. I'm looking forward to unpacking that on, on our event tonight. Carissa, welcome to the panel. Uh, let me go ahead and just ask you, you know, one of the other things we're going to talk about tonight is this phrase, inquiry-based learning. Will you describe what that is for us? Yeah, absolutely, Devin. I love talking about this. Inquiry-based learning is a method of learning where students are active participants in the learning process. St students learn by doing and by asking, answering, and exploring thought-provoking questions. Through inquiry or this desire or a need to know, students are encouraged to access and apply prior knowledge, that knowledge they come into the learning experience with, while being challenged to think critically and deeply about new knowledge and new concepts. Mm. And as a faculty member, I absolutely love this approach. Krista, can you give us a little bit inside of what it actually looks like practically within the classroom? Yeah, absolutely. So in each of our learners' classes, um, the learning is activated by what we call inquiry statements and inquiry questions. And combined, these give students an opportunity to think conceptually about what it is they are learning or about to learn. So these questions guide students through the thinking process and they lead to continued dialogue and discovery. And students actively participate in answering these questions which hopefully then leads to more discovery, more inquiry, and then the cycle just continues. Um, more curiosity. Inquiry is so integral to the learning process and this um, idea of just continuing to ask questions that teachers often will say, what questions do you have? rather than do you have any questions, mm -hmm. assuming that students have more questions based on what it is that they just discovered. And again, just as a faculty member and the question that you're, the, the, the thought that you just put out there as far as asking what questions do you have versus do you have any questions is really a game changer because that goes into the, the mindset of like, it's natural to have questions and it's unnatural to not have questions. Chris, as we kind of pivot in, into the next part of our panel, let me just ask you this. You've done a great job unpacking inquiry-based learning and what it looks practically. How is it different from other schools or even, quite frankly, how Monta Vista once, quote unquote, did school before we became an international baccalaureate school? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So this methodology is different because it moves the learning experience for the student from just fact transfer, where students just need to memorize information to regurgitate it on a test, to how students can relate to and apply what they're learning to a myriad of contexts. For example, traditional models will often focus on just the what and stay there. Again, that fact transfer. We focus on the what, those things that are worth knowing and important to know, things that students need to know in each content area. But we take it one step further. We focus on the so what. Why is this relevant? Why, is, why does this matter? And then more importantly, the now what? How can I take what I have just learned and apply my learning to a multitude of contexts, both inside and outside of school and in the real world? So it's the what combined with the so what and now what that makes for just that really rich and non-conventional way of learning. Yeah. And I will just say again, from my perspective as faculty, each student is much more able to own their own learning and really go and follow their passions at, at their pace. 
Uh, Susie, I want to bring you back into the conversation. And, you know, if we were to do a Google search of international baccalaureate, we would find as anything on the internet with a lot of different insights and, and feelings toward it. But I would love for you to really unpack how does the IB framework fit within a Christian school and Christian doctrine? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's a beautiful picture. We talk a lot about the attributes of a learner. We, we, Chris had just mentioned we want our students to ask questions. We want them to inquire. Um, we also want them, as they're developing as learners, we want them to be compassionate and kind. We want them to take healthy risks. We want them to be discerning. Um, we also want them to be principled. And all of these attributes, this approach is focused on developing those while they're acquiring all of this knowledge. And it's a beautiful reflection, if you think about it, of the attributes of God. We want our students to be so principled when they come across that unfamiliar information, right? They are equipped. They're so grounded in a biblical perspective. They're equipped to defend their faith, and they're able to reflect and demonstrate those attributes that we know are, are reflective of the attributes of Christ. Yeah, well said. And I think that that's one of the things as we prepare tweens and teens to go into young adulthood and go to college and the workforce and, and life beyond NBC is as a parent, especially, I want to make sure that my kid is equipped to think critically, equipped to whatever the position is on whatever subject is able to articulate and verbalize that. And we're really going to get a chance to kind of unpack how we do that here at NBC. With that, let me bring in some of our absolute rock stars, members of our faculty who work so hard and, by the way, are taking time out of their night to join us and help us out on our broadcast tonight. Let me welcome Leslie Barreras. Let me welcome Tim Peters. Let me welcome Mariko Bliss. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, Leslie, let me begin with you. Can you just give us a little snapshot, a little bio about who you are, what you teach, things like that? Sure. Thanks for having me, Devin. Um, I have the unique um, privilege of working in both schools. I teach Spanish B for eighth grade level students and a course called Ab Initio, which is an 11th grade class. Um, both classes are designed for um, new Spanish one level one students. Those are students that have little to no experience in the Spanish language. And um, I really enjoy working in both schools. That's awesome. Tim, introduce yourself. Oops. Should, I need to unmute. Uh, Tim Peters, this is my fourth year here at Monta Vista, and so I have the privilege of teaching sixth grade Bible, and I uh, also have a language class. Awesome. And Mariko. Uh, Devin, well, thank you for having me tonight. I'm excited to uh, be able to uh, be part of this panel. Um, so this is my second year here at Monta Vista. Um, I have a couple of different hats that I wear. So um, I am a teacher for grade seven language and literature, um, uh, language arts, English. And then I am a grade eight teacher for individuals and societies, which is a social sciences course. Um, I'm also the grade six and seven guidance counselor. But other than that, <laughs> let me ask you this, Mariko, you've had a, a unique experience. You come to MVC not only of, of having taught international baccalaureate programs at other schools, but you and your husband both have actually taught around the world. So give us a little bit of insight. Uh, what are some things you notice that are different with MVC versus some of your previous stops? Absolutely, Devin. Um, so the, this is my third international baccalaureate school. Um, and I will say that um, one of the things that I think is so special about Monta Vista is that Christian worldview that is at the heart of what we do each and every day. It is our ethos. It is, um, it is like I said, the heartbeat of, of, of Monta Vista. Um, and I love that spiritual formation and developing the whole person is our primary I guess, concern and our, and our primary, um, 
objective in, in developing our kids. And um, what I think is wonderful about that is that the International Baccalaureate comes alongside that Christian worldview um, with the IB Learner profiles that um, Susie was kind of bringing up a little bit. You know, we want the kids to be open-minded. We want them to be caring. We want them to be balanced. Um, we want them to be principled. And um, those are not just skills that you develop in the classroom. Those are lifelong skills that we want the kids to be able to attain in order to be successful in whatever they do, um, not just here and now, but in the future. So I think one of the things that I really love about Monta Vista is just that development of the whole person, um, which the IB does, you know, as, a, as, a, as an organic piece, but then also that spiritual formation and that Christian worldview that is at the heart of what we do. Absolutely. Thank you for unpacking that. We're definitely going to come back and unpack some more of that throughout our experience tonight. But Tim, let me bring you back into the conversation. You teach Bible. When it comes to this inquiry-based model that we've been talking about, what does that look like practically within the, the boundaries of your classroom? Great question. That's a great question, Devin. Um, so for sixth grade Bible, um, really just taking advantage of the fact that the kids by nature have inquiring minds. Um, they they want to know uh, information. And so um, practically, for example, we're looking at the encounters with Jesus, um, specifically the shepherds in Luke chapter two. And so um, even as recently as today, the question was, um, what were the responsibilities of the shepherds? And so the students actually researched um, that question. They were able to acquire the, the, uh, the information themselves as opposed to me just telling them. Um, so it's, just, it's a shift in how we go about learning. Mm -hmm. and, and from there, we, you know, like Carissa talked about, asking more questions. Um, how did God, what, what attributes of God do we see? um, in, in the shepherd, um, mm. why did God choose to, to reveal himself to shepherds? Uh, why did, why were they the ones that received the news, um, about the birth of Christ? So, um, it, it's tremendous, uh, learning opportunities. Tim, let me follow up a little bit with that because, you know, certainly within our, our diverse student population here that we have families that probably come from what we would loosely label as a, a traditional Christian background. We have families and learners here that are not part of any uh, faith or religious belief or, or anything like that. And so for families that are on that side of the spectrum, how, how would a learner in your class continue to thrive, even though that's not something that they either understood or maybe even agreed with? Yeah, no, that's a uh, great, great question. So my hope um, in the course is that uh, regardless of where the students are with their faith, if they're, if they're coming from a uh, Christian family, if they're coming from, you know, sort of like the middle of the road, or if they're no faith at all, um, my hope is that by the end of the course, through discovery, through the lessons that we that we go through um, the units, that the person, um, the family that is maybe not or maybe even questioning, wondering um, or on this path of just trying to find out, OK, who is God? Um, does he care about me? Uh, how do I know that Christianity is the truth? Um, by the time that we get to the end. Uh, that 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 student will um, be on the path of becoming a follower of Christ, um, or you know perhaps they they will just at least planting the seed um, to begin their journey. So um, that's yeah. that's my hope. And so I, I get would it be proper to say there there's a winsome invitation made, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, Leslie, let me bring you into this and let's talk a little bit about grading here at MVC. What is different from grading here versus maybe some of the other schools within our area that families might be used to? Yeah, Devin. So most um, schools traditionally are on a point-based system where students are evaluated based off of 
what they got right and what they got wrong. Um, and for years, it's always been like that. Um, what's uniquely different about Monta Vista is that we're actually looking at what the students, yes, maybe still haven't formed the whole understanding of, but there's no points taken off. It's not a points-based system. It's more of a starting place where students can be evaluated and then they get the opportunity again to go back and learn things again and then prove the learning again. Um, it's a continuous push forward towards the learning and the mastery of this content as opposed to um, just an end of, you know, you, you just get what you get and here's your points and here's what you've earned. Right, right. Which we're going to talk about in a little bit when it comes to things like homework and stuff. And, and one of the things that you mentioned was mastery. We also have this phrase that we use, demonstration of learning, which it's not just a substitute. We're not getting rid of words like test and final exam and just merely replacing it with the phrase demonstration of learning. But, but Leslie, while I've got you here, can you just kind of explain a little bit more? So make sure that I've got it right the student can try things over and over and over again. Um, in a traditional setting, that might look like tests or quizzes or even homework that if they're not doing well on, those points are counted against them in a grade. But here we're talking about almost like practice before a game or before a performing arts um, performance where we're allowed to practice, practice, practice without any negative consequence to our grade. Ultimately, and here's where that phrase comes back, to demonstrate what we've learned through all of this part. Would that be accurate? Yeah, Devin. So what our students do here at Monta Vista is they continuously practice whatever that content is for that unit. So it's a co consistent practice towards that demonstration of learning, whether that is through a a quiz or it's through a homework or a classwork assignment, there is that opportunity for the student to continue to get better and then at, in the end, demonstrate everything that they've learned in that unit. And that's really different when you think about the traditional way of grading as a whole. Yeah. And so you also, you're, you're unique. And Tim, I'm going to come to you in a moment too. But Leslie, you're unique in the fact you're not just faculty here, but you've had one daughter graduate here. You have another one that's a senior. And so through the mom lens, how have you seen this really impact your daughter that's a senior this year? Yeah, um, grading was a big uh, source of stress for us in the beginning. I have a, a daughter who um, is really diligent about doing homework and making sure that it's all turned in and, and really relying on those points in that formative sense, the formative being the homework, the quizzes and all those areas. And now with the new system, um, it's, it's actually, you know, where you would think it would have caused her to maybe just not care or not be interested, she actually puts more effort in because she has the ability to fail and mm -hmm. to not do well. And then she still has the opportunity to get better and better and better. So the grading for us has actually shifted where I've seen great strides in my own daughter, where she takes up those opportunities to go and, and do it again and get it better and perfect it. Um, she's just really come a long way with that. We all have as a family. Yeah, thank you for that. And I think that for those of you that are joining us tonight, you're going to hear us continue to circle back to these phrases and concepts. And one of the ones that we'll circle back to often is this freedom to fail, that we don't need to fear failing, blowing it, having a dumpster fire of a project or a test or whatever else, because we're iterating, we're getting better as we go along. Tim, really quickly in 20 seconds or, or less, you're also a, a parent here. Your son is in the high school. What are some of the things that you've noticed through our way of grading and, and working towards mastery when it comes to your son? Um, yes. Like Leslie, uh, my son is a senior. And so um, I think the shift has been instead of being so focused on points, um, now he's actually having to demonstrate what he actually knows mm. um, in his courses. And so it's, it's pushed him as a learner and helped him develop and helped him to grow. Um, for example, in one of his papers, he got, he, I think he got an, a B plus. And so he just went back and iterated on it and he was able to raise his grade to an A. Um, so that's just, you know, one tangible example that um, the, the proof is really in the pudding. It, it works. And just once again, for our families who are still trying to maybe kind of wrap their minds around the concept, one of the things that Tim brought up 
is students will receive a quote unquote grade on their assignments, but the grade up until that last master grade are just kind of there to show the students where their progress is at. So to take Tim's son getting a B plus on a paper as an example, with that comes a bunch of specific comments from the instructor about ways that Tim's son could improve. And then Tim's son has the opportunity to go back and make those improvements before that final demonstration of learning and showing mastery is actually turned in at the end of the semester. Um, Mariko, I want to bring you back into this. We've used phrases like demonstration of learning. We've used phrases like inquiry-based learning. The next one that we want to kind of unpack is this thing called mastery. What, what does this mean and what does it look like practically? Okay. Well, um, thanks, Devin. So mastery um, fits in with, uh, with our units in terms of the skills um, and the content knowledge that we want the students to be able to attain. And as Leslie and Tim have um, so eloquently put it, um, the, the process for the formative assignments is that practice piece, right? So those are the ones where students should have the ability to practice those skills and show their knowledge without the fear of, oh my goodness, I'm going to get a bad grade or, you know, the pressure that often comes with that. Um, and so we want to give those chances for iteration. And so the students do have a lot of opportunities to iterate. And as Tim was pointing out, um, <clears throat> or, you know, as, as you were pointing out, Devin, a lot of feedback is given, um, whether that is through um, our learning management system in, in focus, um, or whether that is through verbal feedback or um, sitting with the student and, 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 and going through um, a paper or a test or some other kind of project, there's always feedback that's given in the classroom, um, both in and out of the classroom, I should say. So um, when it comes to mastery, we do want those students to be able to get to a point where they are moving and moving up the learning ladder. And so the formatives are a way for us as teachers to scaffold and to say, okay, I see where my students are in terms of their skill development. Um, I know where I need to shift or I need to um, make adjustments so that um, I can help guide them along that, that path and have them move up the learning ladder in order to reach that pinnacle, which would be that summative assessment or demonstration of learning. And um, again, I think the biggest thing is just getting them to a point where they are ready for the next piece, whether that be for the next unit or for the next school year, or um, you know, when they graduate, making sure that they are uh, college ready or career ready. So those, all, those, all those parts fit into to mastery in terms of uh, how we do our grading and standards-based grading. Yeah, well said. And I think the other important piece of this, if I can just add to that, Mariko, is that each learner is really going, that, that template of mastery is really going to be individualized. So I know my daughter, who is not yet here because she is still in grade school, um, she has learning challenges. But when she is here and she's part of the way that we do learning here at MVC, she's going to be held up only to herself when it comes to her ability to master things. When it shows her growth, not going to be compared to anyone else in the class like traditional um, scoring has been done. It's just going to be her showing her growth over the course of the semester, the year, and then her, her career here at MVC. Uh, Tim and Lester, let me come back to you. And Tim, I'll start with you. What are some things that you've seen as a faculty member when it comes to students having the opportunity to have further iteration, a, a chance to keep refining things as they go along in the semester. Give, give us a, a quick success story, if you can. Well, I think that um, by and large, students see the connection between the formatives and, and their demonstration of learning. Mm -hmm. And so um, even, though, even, if, even if they're not doing so well on the, on the formatives, um, they can continue to work uh, to make corrections, to make changes. And then by the time we get to the demonstration of learning, um, hopefully they've been able to make those adjustments and um, they're, they're prepared for it. They're ready for it. And so they, they can do well. Um, so I was just thinking uh, it's, it's made the, it's made the grading a lot more um, worthwhile and the students actually see their the effort. They see the um, the energy they're putting in on the formatives um, as worthwhile because it is going to pay off when they get to the demonstrations of learning. 
Yeah, well said. Leslie, do you have maybe a, a quick success story you can share about a, a particular student that maybe really was able to, to take advantage and, and show incredible growth over the course of a semester? Yeah, I, I'm, uh, again, I'm, I'm in both schools, but in the high school course that I teach, I have a number of international students. Uh, my international students are coming in having already spoken one language and then also kind of in the middle of learning English as well. And then we've, we're asking them to learn another language, which is Spanish. And so in the beginning, there's some intimidation there. You know, they're, they're very concerned with their performance, but they're also really concerned with learning this new language. Um, and I had a, an experience with one student in particular who um, was so nervous, um, very nervous to give oral presentations, to show me an example of writing um, in all areas of our criterion-based grading. She was just really, really stressed out about it. Um, and what was really encouraging was once she realized that it, she could come in as much as she wanted to, that she could get the practice in as much as she wanted wanted to. Um, this particular student was in my office hours two to three times a week, just wanting to have conversation with me, just wanting to practice that dialogue. And um, not only was it speak volumes of the student, but it just really spoke volumes of our system that we've formed a system that's made our students feel comfortable enough to continue to come in and ask for that help and that extra layer of uh, assistance before we get to that end result, which is that demonstration of learning. Yeah, great, great example. And I think, you know, one of the things that really came out in your response was we've got within our scheduling system so many different opportunities that are very purposeful to allow learners to go to individual uh, uh, faculty members to work as part of peer groups that it's, just, it's built into our, our schedule itself. And we'll get to that in just a moment. Susie, I want to bring you back into the conversation because I know having had a teenager, I could say easily, all this sounds great, but I know that my kid is chief of procrastination. So what in the world doesn't all of this do it as many times as you want to until it's finally turned into the end? Aren't, aren't we just kind of translating that to procrastination for these tweens and teens? Well, first, none of our Monta Vista students procrastinate. <laughs> Managers. <laughs> yes, they are teenagers for sure. So we have those um, <laughs> things in place. We need to have structures where they can be accountable and we can help them develop that self-management. So I think there's two places and the first place was already alluded to by um, Leslie and Tim. And that's just that intrinsic place. Once the students see the relationship between their formative work Mm -hmm. and their ability to demonstrate their learning. And then that relationship, that demonstration of learning relationship to the grade that's determined, their mastery grade, they mm -hmm. start to see that relationship. And so that's motivating in itself as well as that place where they can try and fail and try again, right? That safety we talked about in the classroom environment. But also um, for those that need a little bit more assistance in structure, we have um, an opportunity after school for students to stay and uh, work with their teachers and um, catch up on some of that formative work that might be missing and to better prepare themselves for those demonstrations of learning. So mm -hmm. if just that internal motivation or the structures in the home might not be enough for a particular student, they're still developing that self-management, then we provide some external accountability um, after school to help them manage that. Yeah, which is fantastic. Carissa, what are some of the, I guess, similarities or differences? How does this work in the middle school? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Well, first, we, we have to understand that middle schoolers are the most awesome people on this planet, um, for sure. Um, but we also have to acknowledge that this particular demographic of our student body um, does not come um, naturally equipped with a lot of self-management, a lot of self-agency. The, these are skills that we as a team have to understand need to be explicitly taught and cultivated in this young group of students. Um, and we are committed to doing that. 
everything that Mrs. Swing um, describes does apply to middle school, um, but we do take it a step further in terms of that um, explicit um, cultivating of those skills that are really foundational so that by the time they do get to Mrs. Swing in the high school, they really have had an opportunity to grow in these areas. Um, two examples would be that we offer a power skills course. Um, Mr. Peters actually teaches that course, and this is an onboarding um, experience for students in the sixth grade um, so that they are taught uh, strategies and um, tools, given tools to successfully navigate uh, the middle years and beyond. Um, we also, um, with the care of Mariko Bliss, have weekly meetings with our faculty and we do student success reporting where we actually identify the students that need more support, but we also identify those students who are thriving. So we're taking this individualized approach, really looking at each one of our learners as unique beings that um, have different and unique needs. And so we want to take a look at those, those ways in which we can really come alongside each of our learners to gird them and equip them um, to be successful. And as our mission says, for them to reach their highest potential, whatever that looks like. Yeah, well said. Let me, let me follow up just a little bit. By placing, and we've talked about this a couple of times tonight, but by placing such a, a primary focus on skill development, are learners going to be able to leave here, whether they come at sixth and leave after 12th or come at ninth and leave after 12th or, or some other uh, formula like that? Are, are they going to be able to be prepared for college, the workforce, things like that by such a high concentration on skill development? Indeed, we believe that they, they are going to be prepared because learning at MVC does equip students not only with what they need to know, but also with what they can do. And what they can do is really important in this highly innovative, ever-changing world that they're, they're a part of. Um, we want them to grow in and apply skills such as critical thinking and problem solving. Um, to become effective communicators, both orally and in the written word. We want them to be able to work well with others and collaborate, not just work side by side in parallel learning, but truly collaborating and, and engaging in this reciprocal teaching and learning from, from their peers. Um, we want them to be creative digitally and non-digitally and how to bring those skills to the world around them. Um, and to see themselves as lifelong learners who truly do have this passion to learn um, and to pursue whatever path that God leads them on, which will be so uniquely different. But with this skill set coupled with this knowledge, um, we do believe we will have our students very, very well prepared for college and career. Yeah, I just anecdotally, I'll, I'll toss this into the mix that I, I had lunch today with a former Mustang. And she's been graduated almost 10 years now. And she came in today and we sat down and over conversation over lunch, just talked about how she felt that as someone who taught history, it was for me never about memorizing dates and dead people, but very much learning how to be a critical thinker and being able to validate whether a, a source was reliable or not. And, and she's just talking about now that she's a young woman out in the world, how those skills have been so helpful for her um, with things that are totally unrelated to her continuing academic career, but just being a young woman in the world and all of the different sources that we're faced with um, each and every day, whether it's on social media or news or whatever else, and how she can really navigate her way through that because, because of the skills that, that she learned here. So thank you for that, Carissa. Yeah, that is a, a definite tenet of an IB education is how to apply what you know and the skills that you have to unfamiliar situations. That right there will define an IB learner. And that is why students will be successful, whichever college they pursue and whichever pathway they pursue is it is transference. And that's what, what we are aiming for is to really develop learners that can be successful um, in, in any of the, like I said, wherever God leads them. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Carissa. Susie, let me, let me come back to you. When it starts talking about things like homework, uh, we've talked about um, opportunities 
built into the schedule for learners to, whether study is part of a group, whether to go to office hours, things like that. When it comes to homework specifically, though, how much homework can a learner at NBC expect on any given night? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I, I'm going to say it depends. If you're looking for a tangible number, I'm going to say it depends. But I can say um, that we do take into account that we know they need to have some school home balance. We want them to have that as well. So part of talking about how we assess students differently and how we look at learning, part of that plays into what we think the value of homework is. So we do think there is a time and a place where students need to have some additional practice. There needs to be some reading. There needs to be some preparation, some iteration or revising. All these things we know play into their progress and the pace of learning. Yeah. Time, we want that balance. We recognize a lot of our families travel from great distances, and some of them are doing after-school activities. So we do limit. We do have some tangible guidelines, um, which, you know, there's some courses we ask for that to be 15 minutes or less, you know, a couple times a week. Uh, we ask for some of our elective courses to not um, have homework at all for our students. So there are some natural parameters that we do build in and some guidelines, but it's, it's with that intention. And it, of course, varies by student. If a typical student takes 15 minutes, uh, one student might not have any time they need to spend on it. And another student that might be 30 minutes. So we, all of those things we want to take into account when we're looking for that balance. Yeah, absolutely. And, and once again, with our block schedule, which we'll try to talk about in just a moment with 80 minutes per class within that faculty does a great job of carving out time during those class periods each and every day to offer time to work on those formative or those practice things that are going to ultimately work towards mastery. Um, let's pivot a little bit. We've got some questions that have come through chat. So I definitely want to take a few moments and walk through those as best we can. And in some cases, I may not asked your question exactly how you wrote it. I may be combining some questions here and there if the topic is of similar nature. So Susie, let me stick with you for this. We've talking about international baccalaureate. Um, it is an internationally branded thing. It has um, with it a reputation of being rigorous. And so is IB truly for everyone? Yeah, I think it. I think it is. Yeah, the approach to learning is what we're talking about, um, and it has this built into it this ability to really differentiate. You just mentioned the block schedule, and for teachers to be able to navigate that time with students, to be able to have um, kind of that deep dive time with students, it gives teachers an ability to really assess their students during that formative work. It's not instruction some last minute instruct, you know, parting instructions, and then the student leaves and the practice is on their own, gives the ability for the teacher to really guide the learning while the students are doing that formative work. And that's really beautiful for our students that need to be challenged. They need that rigor. And it's always, it's also a really sweet thing for our students that really um, need to learn differently or need to have some academic support in a different way. So it allows the teacher to really kind of assess those things in real time. And so, so that's a, a really sweet thing. But there's also an opportunity for rigor. You know, the, the um, International Baccalaureate does have a diploma. So it's an additional diploma to what Monta Vista offers. So we have a college preparatory university admissions diploma. And then there is an additional diploma. And so students in their junior and senior year can opt to take a more rigorous course load and take some assessments um, in order to um, try to attain that additional diploma. So that opportunity for, for additional rigor exists, but there's very much voice and choice with the family and the student, what that looks like as far as that student's giftings, the balance they want in their home, all of those other things that come into play for families. Well, continue down that path a little bit, because when folks start to hear, oh, they've got different diploma tracks, that that's an entirely different conversation in a lot of ways. So let's just touch on it very quickly. When we're thinking of different diploma tracks, and in particular, the International Baccalaureate Diploma, it's not only more rigorous, but Susie, how does that actually impact and affect college admissions in itself? Not just college readiness per se, but when college admissions groups are actually looking at applications from students. Yeah, so we've heard from quite a few um 
uh, admissions officers, and we've done quite a bit of research. Our guidance team has really looked into that as we were walking down this path and really determining if this was um, an approach to learning we wanted to adopt and become a member of this organization. And so, yeah, colleges and universities really do love to see um, IB students come into uh, their admissions portal because they know that these students um, are not just where they need to be as far as content, but they know that they have the skills right, to become independent learners. So they know that they're going to have a higher retention rate um, often with IB learners. And, and um, there's lots of stuff out there uh, that we can talk about statistics and things like that. But there's also just a benefit to that additional IB diploma. So when we talk about the diploma that IB offers to some of our graduates, it does carry some, co some college credit. For um, the University of California system, for example, it's the equivalent of semester, semester credits. And so I don't wanna misquote anything, so I'm not gonna quote numbers at you, but um, it's similar to a higher level, just like we would see in advanced placement and other things where there is is equivalent college credit and waiting. Yeah, and the great news is in a future live stream event, uh, which you can register for, um, our head of our guidance team will be part of the conversation and have all the specifics about that ready to go. So by all means, check your calendar for that one and make sure that you come back for that one. Um, let me ask this, and actually, Leslie, let me toss this at you. It, it kind of goes on the homework side of things once again, but hey, listen, if you guys are giving kids all kinds of chances to wait till the, the last minute to turn things in or do-overs, um, are they motivated at all to do assignments that actually are ungraded? What, what's your experience been? Yeah, Devin, um, you know, it's it's very unique. You know, in the beginning, I was skeptical, probably like a lot of parents are in that I thought, oh, this is this is never going to work. How are we going to motivate students um, that traditionally wouldn't be motivated or that just, you know, they have a different philosophy on learning. Right. But what I found was throughout my experience this semester is that they have um, actually fallen right into it and realized the benefit of turning in these formative assignments of doing this work and earning that that feedback that we give them at the end of a class assignment or even after a quiz um, where they can take a look at it and they can learn and say okay um, I didn't know this at this point but I do know where I can improve for the next time um, so I've seen this just really work really well for a lot of my students. And in my own home with my own student, I've seen this really work for her as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, we're just, we're one semester into this as a school-wide philosophy. And one of the things that I've seen over the course of time since we started in August, now rolling into our second semester, it, to me personally, it really kind of mirrors my own experience of learning to ride a bike. And I know that that gets used a lot, but here, here's my take on it is that there's always an unsureness about it when you first start pedaling, whether you've got training wheels or not. But once you realize how to do it, it's actually super freeing. And I, I, I've seen that play out in my classroom when kids understand that, oh, all Mr. Clever is looking at is just that I can demonstrate these things and show growth over the course of, of a semester. And I think that that has allowed them to have incredible freedom and taken away a lot of the traditional stresses that came with learning, quote unquote, the, the old way or, or other ways. Susie, I mentioned our block schedule. Can you go into that and just give us kind of a, a macro view of that? Sure. Yeah. So we, um, our kids take eight classes. So students take eight classes, four per day. So it's an 80 minute block. Most days is just a one shorter day. And so we do odd and even days. So it's one, three, five, and seven on an odd day in periods two, four, six, and eight on an even day. Okay. So that part's the simplest part to remember. The part that gets confusing, mostly for adults. So parents, I'm just telling you, your kids pick this up really fast. Um, so it's typically the adults that are worried and the students have no trouble with it. Um, so our periods rotate. And so it, for example, if you have an odd um, day that starts one, three, five, seven, on a Monday, your Tuesday would be two, four, six, eight. Your Wednesday would start with period three, three, five, seven, and then one. And then it continues to do that until it makes it through that eight. Mm 
day cycle, and then it starts again. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for that. And one is that our kids just learn differently. They learn different subjects. Some learn better in the morning, some in the afternoon. Um, sometimes things happen that affect their day. And so sometimes those rigorous classes or different personalities and combinations of students in the room make a difference at what time of day they have them. It gives the, the student and the teacher an opportunity to maximize the learning at different times of the day. And additionally, we have a lot of students that participate. Um, we have more than 70% um, in the high school, and I, I think the middle school numbers are probably fairly high as well, that participate in some level of our athletics or our fine arts programs. And so often these students are traveling, um, leaving early for games, and a lot of our teachers our, our coaches or leaders or directors in these programs. And so what the rotating schedule also does, it allows these students um, and these teachers an opportunity to not miss the same critical class um, each time that they need to leave during a season or during a production. Um, it allows them to, to miss different classes and for students to benefit from instruction um, as consistently as possible. So it's been a pretty fun and um, beautiful thing. And like I said, it sounds confusing when you don't get to see it up in front of you, but our students are not having any trouble navigating it. Yeah. And let me just springboard off of that as someone that was wholly confused how this thing was going to work at the beginning. I have personally found it to be amazing because Susie, you're right. Getting to see like that same group of kids at different parts of the days of the week and stuff has been so super, super fun. And it's also fun to see, as you said, like some of the kids, like they are morning kids and man, they are ready to, to go from the get go. And other kids don't wake up until like the crack of noon. And so you get to see them in the afternoon and, and them thrive later in the day. So I, I love what we've done with the schedule. Um, Susie, I'm going to stick with you because another question came in specifically for high school. Okay. Will MVC offer other foreign languages beyond Spanish? Wow, putting me on the spot. Boom. Love it. Um, right now, for our planning purposes for the coming year, we're, we're looking at Spanish. We do have some students, um, and it, it's they've been exceptions that have started taking other languages, that Spanish would be their third or their fourth language. And we work with those families very individually. But for the most part, we plan on them continuing with Spanish and it goes six through 12. So we really want our students um, to be as biliterate as they can be developmentally by the time they leave um, high school. Does not mean that we have closed the discussion on other languages, um, but I'm not prepared right now to announce anything. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well done. Nice dodge. Um, we got a question come in that talks about what are COVID precautions taken on campus for students? So allow me to just kind of jump in and, and tackle this as best I can. And then Carissa and Susie, feel free to, to weigh in as well. As, as you well know, dear audience members, um, not just Monta Vista, but all schools everywhere have um, had to do a, a lot of real-time adjustments to schedules, to remote learning, uh, to campus learning, to all kinds of protocols uh, that you have obviously taken part of as, <laughs> as a citizen of this state. Um, we currently, under current health protocols, are abiding by what our local health department, which is Santa Cruz County, has advised us. So right now, today, as we are live streaming this event, um, we are actually in a period of remote learning right now. Uh, we will soon return to live on-campus instruction. And when that happens, and has it, as it has happened up until this point, is students, faculty, everyone on campus is masked while indoors. And that is, again, in line with our current health protocols for our county um, health office, and will continue to be in line with what they advise as the best routes to take. Susie, Carissa, would either one of you like to jump in there and either clarify anything I mentioned or add to it? I think what you mentioned, Devin, is right on. And I think I would just want parents to know that we are, um, like parents, navigating all those different oversight organizations. We have an athletics oversight organization that has protocols for our athletes, um, right? We have our county um, oversight, the health department. So each of those things, we just uh, carefully try to stay informed on and then take whatever unnecessary safety steps on campus that we need to. 
Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. That's going to kind of bring things here to a close. As always, if there was something maybe that you wanted to check out again, you can find a copy of this uh, probably later this week, early next week at mvcs.org. Also, you can swing on by there and check out and register for the other live stream events that are coming on the next several Wednesdays, same time, 7 p.m. Pacific. And next week, we're actually going to be talking about student life here at NBC. We're going to have some special guests, including some current Mustang students as well. Don't forget, each live session that you do attend, your household's going to automatically be entered into a drawing that's going to receive a $500 tuition credit. So you want to make sure that you show back up for that. If you have any questions, you can reach out at admissions at mbcs.org. And as always, we thank you once again for hanging out with us tonight. And we will look forward to seeing you here on campus as a Mustang in the near future. Take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us.